Hello, chess friends. International Master David Proust here with your highlights for week five of the Pro Chess League. We start things off with National Master Grant Shu or GXU Chess. Um, the MVP for this year from the, uh, or sorry, for this year, <laughs> perhaps for this year, but for now, for this week, from the Atlantic Division, he leads from board four the New York Marshals into battle against the St. Louis Archbishop's super feared lineup coming out again with Wesley So and Fabiano Caruana both in the mix. In the first round, he drew Fabiano, and you can only imagine how good his day was if I'm not even showing you this. Here he is with black against Wesley So. He's up a pawn. He seems to have just a better position. But Wesley's got a crazy tactic here with rook takes f2, even though it appears that it's the white king that's in trouble on the back rank. Suddenly we see if black takes the rook with queen f2, white has queen d5 check. And if king h8, queen d8 back rank made. If king to f8, then bishop to d6 check would, you know, force the king to e8 where white could take the rook with check, etc., etc., etc. What can... Um, Grant do here. What does he have in reserve or did he just get tactic by Wesley? Well, he thinks for a little bit and he has this rookie one check back rank a6 deflecting the queen from the back rank Nothing white can do Wesley has to give up the queen hunker down and uh, Draw this rook and bishop versus queen end game, which I don't think he would do against a fellow 27 2800 player and uh <clears throat> Grant scoring draws against Fabiano and Wesley from board four, I think really set the tone for the match where um, the archbishops were just behind and playing like a little bit desperate when they didn't need to. Here's another example. The very next round, he's playing against an IM who also outrates him by 200 points, hands cool Neiman. He's got black here and Neiman with white could obviously get a perpetual here on the queen, but he's feeling like, hey, got to beat this guy we got to come back we need more points i can't take the draw here and uh he tries to go for more and uh a couple moves later he's going to be wishing that he hadn't the next point i want to show you is this after queen to d6 by neiman obviously a super complicated position all kinds of things can happen but here grant is just so alert he spots the chance for g3 it looks like he's trying to crack the d4 square with his pawn on e5, but instead g3 hitting the knight, and when pawn takes, sacks the knight on d4 because the queen has just left the defense of the rook on a1. And if pawn takes d4, he has queen d4 check, and then queen takes the rook on a1. So Hans decided he couldn't take that, traded the queens instead, but now Grant just mops everything up, check, 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 munch, munch, munch. And he goes on to win that game, putting even more impossible pressure on the archbishops to try and come back. Next round, he's got white against Froelich 67, Sir Nicholas Rosenthal, who has often been the starring board four, creating the upsets, but here Grant's already created the upsets, and now in a complicated position where if he retreats his knight, black could have great compensation for the exchange sack, perhaps. He insists on keeping the initiative for white. He plays c6 instead of saving his knight. Queen takes a7, still leaving the knight hanging. If pawn takes knight, he has rook takes c6, threatening mate, bishop e5, and then rook f to c1. And as far as I can tell, black has no way to defend against rook c7, check, followed by a completely quick mating attack. So black instead covers c6. b5, still leaving the knight hanging. What? Did you say the initiative was important? Nicholas takes it. He takes here. Mate on b7 is threatened. There's no real way to clear space for the king because the rook moves queen b7 check, queen takes b8 check, queen takes c7 check, etc, etc, etc. So just sacks the knight. Now we see that mating threat on c7 again if rook d7, queen a8 mate. So the king just makes a run for it. And obviously Grant mopped him up a couple moves later to score three out of four and win the MVP this week and uh, really, really lead his team. One more really hilarious moment from the same match is this one here. A game between Sergei Azarov and Fabiano Caruana, which has sort of a... I guess if it were an end game, you could call it a tragic comedy. But with queens and rooks on the board, these kind of things are really exciting mating situations. Fabiano's got the pass pawn on d2. 
and the pass pawn on b3 they're about to queen yeah you might not know which direction the board is up or down or whatever but yeah he's about to queen um i think he could win the game pretty cleanly and calmly here with rook to d7 covering the checkmates on g7 sort of maybe forced in queen e8 or f8 and then the king hides on h7 the pawn on h6 blocks the white rook and the rook on the seventh rank defends against the queen i think then he can calmly go ahead and and win with his pass pawns but fabiano calculates some stuff they're low on time 30 seconds each he queens and he's got this intermediate move, right? He's not playing a queen takes rook, queen g7 mate. Fabiano's seen that. He checks here and then captures the rook. But now, check here. The game should be a draw. I was lucky enough to be watching this thrilling moment live, and you can see that white should be able to check back and forth on e8 or f8 and, and e7, and the black king should go back and forth. And he can't take on h6. Wait, Fabiano takes on h6? This is what he's calculated. He thinks it's winning. After queen f8 check, queen g7... He does indeed win, but um, white could win in this position with g5 check. Not just draw, not just get a perpetual. White could turn this around and win down a rook here with g5 check. Try and follow this. King h5, queen h7, king takes g5, queen to h4 check. King's only move is to f5, queen to h3 check. The king is forced onto either f6 or e5. When queen h8 check will pick up the queen with the long skewer. Oh my lord. So this game could have been a draw, could have been a win, could have been a loss. Who knows? In the end, Fabiano wins it. Wow. Moving on to the other critical match um, in the Atlantic division. A crazy opening here between Sai Krishna and Grandmaster Ray Robson. First board and very strong. Over 2,700 consistent performer for the windmills the webster windmills actually in first place after winning their battle royale in week four they uh get this absolutely lunatic opening position what like attacks the knight with the f pawn attacks the other knight where are things going what is going to happen here well the knight's gonna fling itself at at him he's just gonna get himself castled and then just casually give up a rook there too after all this happens he's the one getting checked and white sort of seems to have his kingside piece is trapped, but White's got no pieces out. Thinks here for a while, doesn't come up with any good way to develop his queen side. There's got to be a better move than trading on d4, which only serves to open lines. Queen f7 is a smart move that he may have missed, attacking the rook and getting out of the way of knight c3. He manages to get his pieces out for black. In comes the knight, and now Ray's ready for violence. Every bishop's looking at the white king. The knight says, yeah, you can't touch me. And moments later, it's made on G2 or on the back rank. A savage first game from Ray. Um, the uh, <clears throat> the chess bras were playing an unusual lineup for them with Sarge back on board one. But instead of going 26, 2600 low... They went 2600, they went Sarich and then 24, 24, 24, whereas the Windmills played the 3 2600 lineup with a low rate of player. Um, Sarich delivered as usual. I mean, look at him converting this rook endgame here. It's not so obvious how to win this for white. He advances this pawn, trying to gain some control in the center, makes a new pass pawn in the center. At the risk of letting the black king take over and black makes pass pawns and makes pass pawns what is this the cleanest way for white to win this here comes the d pawn threatens to queen it a pawn and uh white's winning black has no way to stop a8 queen followed by d8 queen and uh there's no way for black to you know take on d7 without allowing a queen h2 white can take it and then if black takes with king d7 there's rook d2 check trade the rook and make a queen so sarge delivers three and a half out of four points against the tri triple 2600 lineup but even with that the triple 2600 lineup wins perhaps because the i the 2400 ims on the chess bras are only able to score one win and two losses against low-rated Grabinski, who's supposed to be the guy going 0-4, instead goes 2 out of 4 and wins this for his team, although it could be said that if Ray Robson hadn't hung his queen to a mouse slip, the windmills would have won, even without his amazing contribution. Over to the Pacific, the Pandas. Um, 
without their top 2700 rated guns they come in with a balanced lineup against the hapless san francisco mechanics here we've got an interesting position that's been battled from a king's indian for 35 moves between shu xiang yu as white and daniel naraditsky as black um yeah it looks like it looks like a long tense battle but finally shu xiang yu decides it's time to go for it queen g2 Naradisky tries to defend the bishop, and here he strikes with f4. Boom. Got to take it. e5. Boom. All right, so now it looks like he's ready to break through, and uh, Daniel thinks for a while, and apparently, I actually put this position into a computer for five seconds just to see, and the computer said that apparently the only winning move is the move Daniel plays, f3, um, which was just, I mean, what a complicated random position. This is just shocking how everything explodes here. Um, if queen takes, then there's queen takes a2 check. If bishop takes, then he wants to play knight takes b3. And on e takes f6, which seems to mate his king, he wants to play knight d2 check. Defended by the bishop so the queen can't take it. And then on knight d2, queen takes a2. So there's just a sick variation. He's doing sacking this pawn just to open up the bishop for that interference move. Um, Shang Yu swings back his queen here, saying, hey, I'll cover b3 and I'll threaten queen g6. Now what are you going to do? Um, again, only one mi winning move for black, I think. Knight to e4, sacking the knight to all his pieces. What is going on here? Well, however white takes, he loses, apparent, I think. Um, if queen takes, queen a2 should win. If rook takes, then queen g1 check, followed by f2 and making a new queen. So a4 is played to deal with the a-file trouble, but now the f-pawn strikes again and can't be dealt with anymore. And Naradisky went on to mop this up. PSA, don't mess with Naradisky's King's Indian defense. That means you can't play d4, you can't play c4, you can't play knight f3. Well, no, I'm, I'm sure good players can do something. Elsewhere in this match, Xu Shen Yu with black against Parimarjan Negi. Negi scoring three and a half out of four in his debut for the mechanics. Would you know how to win this rook and pawn ending? I had like five different ideas of how you might want to win it, and none of them were the way he actually wins it. G5, what is that about? He's not using his, C, his C4, D5 pawn duo? What is this? Why is he moving all those pawns on the king's side? F5, what on earth? So it's all just to create an H pawn pass pawn on the three on three side? That's bizarre. Here he comes. The king's coming in, but that F pawn looks like it's going to cost him, isn't it? This is how to win this endgame? Wow, that H-pawn sure delivered, huh? Nagy with magical rook endgame technique wins that. The Pandas lose the match to the lowest team in the Pacific, but still maintain first place. They were that far ahead and that strong. Who's in second now? Well, the uh, player of the black pieces here has the answer for that. Jinbo Jinbo, Ju Jinner, 16-year-old phenom, playing black here. Um, she's board four, 2360, playing black against new GM, Michael QTD5, plays a stunning move here, bishop g1, all you have to do is see it, and you can know that this hurts, and this is over, the queen's attacked, made on h2 is threatened, that's it, Jujiner goes on to score three and a half out of four from board four, somehow doesn't get nominated for MVP, though she obviously was the MVP along with Grant Chu, and, um, yeah, her team, the Dallas Destiny, go on to set a record for the season, scoring 14 out of 16 points against the Surfers. This is, like, unheard of in this league of balanced teams. And that stomp moves Dallas up to second place in the Pacific. Okay, one or two other random things going on in the Pacific that caught my eye. Here we've got Sandpacer, another board four, playing against 2,700, Ralph Mamadov. Um, and, uh, here, Sandpaster with three minutes against 12 in the live commentary, they were saying you cannot just like randomly spend 12 minutes on your opening against, against Ralph Mamadov. He's probably just laughing about how he can just move back and forth and wait for you to flag and not have to do anything. Well, not laughing after this Bishop takes the E7, Jason, you, the Sandpaster strikes for the sluggers and, uh, Knight d6 is coming on rookie seven. There was no real good defense. He trades in his queen for three minors. And with two, p with two pawns for white, white has an edge after c3. It's hard to handle, but Jason Yu is up to the task and upsets Ralph Mamadov, scoring a huge point. Um, and then there was this. 
I'm not even going to try to explain this. Here's an end game. If you just look at it, you'd say, good knight, bad bishop, whites up a doubled pawn. Looks complicated, hard to break through, maybe some long positional battle in the offing. No, some bizarre tactical battle. Check out how everything that doesn't make any sense happens. That pawn looks like it should just be dead. Why is it advancing? What? Okay, I guess we can't take that because of the A pawn, but what if we just don't take it and cut the black king off to force him this way and set up... What? Let him queen and play rook g1 discover check? What is going on here? Okay, we all come back and dance around the d-pawn. Wait, white has this. <laughs> what about that f-pawn? Okay, and this? What is going on here? What's going on here? He just sacked his rook for no reason? And now the king's going to win all by his lonesome? Okay, here comes another queen. Everybody wants to be a queen. What? <laughs> And I guess the bishop beats the knight in the endgame, right, guys? Sensei Julio scores a wild point against Soggy Cheese. Vinesh Ravuri just barely beats that board four in that mess. And those are your highlights for this week. See you next week. Um, and also check out the Pro Chess League YouTube channel for Pro Chess League Lessons, where we'll get more in-depth with two of the rook endgames that you've just seen.